Thank you for being here. Uh, this, one of the best reasons to do these is I get to see old friends that I haven't seen for a long time. Thank you. Um, and they came without even being bribed. Um, uh, what I'd uh, like to talk to you about is obviously use of native trees in the home garden. And um, I'm going to say something that is probably surprising to you. Oh, first I should say I'm happy to answer any questions you want about native trees during the talk. If you have questions about non-native plants after the talk, I'm happy to stick around and answer your questions. But uh, this is primarily about natives, so uh, during the talk, let's stick to that subject. Um, uh, the concept that we should um, use native plants in our gardens is an admirable one. I would never say that's not a good idea, that you shouldn't consider that and consider native plants for your garden use. Uh, but, um, in the first place, many California natives like salvias and um, 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 are, at least many of the salvias, are adapted, uh, they uh, originate in places that are very dry in the summer. Their uh, solution to that drought is to lose leaf surface, sometimes lose all their leaves, and sometimes they look pretty awful. And if you think that you can have that beautiful garden or beautiful green plants that you might get from Escalonias or whatever with California natives doing the same thing you've always done in your garden as far as watering, pruning, uh, maintenance goes, and just switch to California natives, forget it. It doesn't work that way. Um, if um, uh, remember that we have Mediterranean climate. What that really means, I'm sure you all know, is that uh, we have a long period that's dry with no rain and the way the weather's been really hot. Uh, we have a shorter period than we'd like that, in which there's rain. And plants, California native trees, are adapted to not having rain during uh, hot weather. We commonly apply water, uh, we think every plant needs water, um, during the summer and we invite all those fungal diseases and problems that wouldn't normally be a problem for California native trees. They're often, uh, the, many of the problems we have in our gardens with natives are our problems, they're not plant problems, they're people problems. And if you're going to use California natives, you have to think very carefully about where the plant came from. Redwoods come from one place, and one environment, which is opposite from coast live oak, or at least um, a, a blue oak. And if you plan to uh, plant redwoods in the same landscape, and fairly near blue oaks, something's going to suffer. Uh, primarily you and your frustration with things not working. But you can see those are people cause problems. They're not plant problems. Uh, if, and this applies to any plant. It's not just California natives. It's just that plants from a Mediterranean climate are adapted to a very narrow set of conditions. And if you're going to make California natives work in your garden, you've got to be knowledgeable about what those conditions are. And that doesn't mean that the conditions for, well, I'll, I have slides that will exhibit this better than my talk, but um, it doesn't mean, well, as an example, coast, oh, and before I forget it, there are some uh, samples here of uh, California natives most people have never seen. Um, uh, but coast redwood grows naturally only in a place where there's fog frequently, if not every day, and uh, uh, rain gauges placed under redwoods have shown 60 inches of rain drip, of fog drip, in addition to the rainfall. Now, if you plant a coast redwood 
in your garden in the lower area here and expect them to do well with the same irrigation program and the same maintenance that you're giving other things, you're probably going to be calling me to ask what's wrong with the redwood trees. So the key is many of the Mediterranean, or many, I'm sorry, of the European plants and Asian plants that we use in our gardens are fairly broadly adapted. Um, the oaks from Ohio and Illinois, that, uh, the deciduous oaks that are used as street trees, um, are somewhat drought tolerant, but they're adapted to summer water. And whatever you do in your garden, they'll probably be fine. Uh, they're tolerant. You put one of our native oaks beside that, and you've got an entirely different set of conditions required. So the point is, um, if you're going to use natives, don't kid yourself. You can't do the same thing you've always done uh, as far as pruning, um, irrigation, uh, or pretty much anything else. You've got to understand your plants better if they're going to survive. And if you're willing to uh, study the plants you're going to use and truly understand where each of them come from, there's no reason you can't have an entire garden of California native plants. It's just you can't willy-nilly go to the nursery and um, pick up natives that are cute or you like. Um, a good example, uh, we use uh, manzanitas. Everybody loves a prostrate manzanita, ground cover. Most of you probably haven't thought about it, but where do prostrate manzanitas come from? They all come from right on the coast, usually within salt spray area of the, of the ocean. Uh, they come from gravelly, sandy soils. There are no prostrate manzanitas indigenous to interior California. They're prostrate because they are constantly hit by the wind and the salt air. And um, prostrate ceanothus, same story. They're prostrate because they've evolved right on the coast. Ceanothus gloriosus, that uh, uh, anchor bay. Um, gee, I wonder where that name came from. <laughs> right on the coast, the only place a prostrate um, uh, uh, Ceanothus comes from is on the coast. The ones that grow here or up in the mountains behind us are all taller. Um, uh, most people know Ceanothus uh, griseus horizontalis, the, or the Yankee Point is the most common cultivar. Um, big glossy leaves, uh, a broad prostrate plant that'll be, should be, three feet high and 40 feet across. The only place a plant like that can uh, uh, occur naturally is on the coast. And uh, if you look at Ceanothus griseus, um, not horizontalis, that plant grows inland, but develops a trunk like that. It's 12 feet tall, 15 feet across. Ceanothus griseus will appear inland, but the horizontal form is only on the coast. In other words, I, I'm repeating myself. If you study the plants you're thinking about buying, there's no reason you can't have a lovely California native garden, but you can't do it by going to the nursery and saying, oh, I'll take three of those because they're, I like their looks. You've got to know what you're talking about if you're going to use California natives. Um, now, when we are dealing with California native trees, there's, I, I realize so far this has all been negative, and I apologize, but um, uh, <laughs> you came to hear facts, and that's what I'm going to give you. Um, uh, California native trees, for the most part, are lousy standard garden subjects. And I'll show you some slides of, uh, to exa uh, exemplify why I say that. Um, again, they're, if they're lousy subjects, it's because of what we do to them. It's not that they're naturally inappropriate. Um, uh, the, um, sorry, once you pass 70 years old, the thoughts 
drift away in some place, I don't know where. Um, but uh, California native trees, by and large, are too large for most of our uh, gardens. Um, now, too large becomes a, um, a subjective uh, opinion to some degree. You may say that having a black oak in your garden that is uh, pretty as a teenager and appropriate as a teenager and is 60 feet tall and 50 feet across as a mature individual is okay. That's up to you. That's fine. But if you're going to plant a black oak, you should do it knowing what's going to happen. Um, people often think California native trees are slow. Um, sure they're slow when they're getting started. Um, everything's slow when it's um, a, a, a plant, uh, when it's young. Um, once a coast live oak reaches about four inch diameter and about 12 feet tall, they usually grow two feet a year or more. You multiply that by 10 years, that's a lot of tree. And you multiply that by 20 years, and that's a really significant yard filling tree. And so I'm not saying there's anything wrong with planting a black oak in your garden. Just be aware what you're doing. Uh, why don't we uh, turn out the lights and um, <laughs> that's not a California native tree. Those are avocados. But uh, out of you, this is old, old news and I apologize. Um, but uh, you need to recognize that a um, a taproot is a juvenile characteristic on a plant. Uh, they, they produce, uh, the ones you see on the uh, left are um, probably three years old, and the goal of the taproot is to merely get down where um, there's water and minerals and uh, to uh, supply uh, those for this new foliage. And um, here's what a taproot does. It gradually atrophies and uh, stops doing anything, literally, and it will often just die. The goal of this young plant is to produce these buttress roots. Once the taproot is established and is feeding the plant, these start to develop, and those are what supports the tree, that's what searches for food. Uh, remember that the best uh, water and uh, the roots, uh, the small roots, are going to head for, could you, um, oh boy, well, uh, these small roots, as they begin to emerge, are what eventually supplies the entire tree with both food and uh, structural stability. So. Um, what this gentleman's doing is really destructive. If you recognize when you're dealing with drought uh, tolerant plants from wherever, um, these roots that emerge during the, uh, uh, near the surface eventually are the part that is supplying that plant with, with everything it has to have. So, um, these are coast live oak roots. Uh, when you brush the leaf litter aside and, and out in a natural setting, not necessarily in a garden, but in a natural setting, those are the uh, roots that are picking up water and minerals. These have a mycorrhizal um, fungi attached and surrounding them, and this is what's doing the work. And you've got to recognize when you're dealing with um, uh, most Mediterranean climate trees, uh, see the entire root systems in the top two and a half feet. Um, there just isn't anything else down there. Um, we commonly uh, assume I, I have uh, uh, primarily what my company does is uh, deal with uh, tree preservation during construction, and we do that at the behest of cities uh, for landscape contractors and builders and so forth. And so this is an inspection for us 
saying, oh my God, here we go. The contractor is saying, well, we haven't cut, we haven't touched the tree, we haven't uh, heard it, we, the roots are all way down there, we haven't touched any of those. Um, you know, most people just don't realize the roots aren't way down there, right, they're right on the surface. And this is very destructive. Anything you do in the top foot of soil is going to damage roots of, of uh, native, well, most plants for that matter. Um, these are, I'm afraid, very common habits. Uh, impatience. You all know how much uh, water impatience need. Um, this is uh, at the edge of a cemetery in Palo Alto. These are coast live oaks. And these sprinklers aren't just watering the lawn, they're wetting the trunks of the trees. Uh, this is coast live oak. Um, uh, they wanted natives. Well, it's a native. Um, these are coast live oak. Um, the gardeners misunderstood the goal of the planting, I think. Um, and these are coast live oak. These are in a golf course in uh, uh, the Menlo Country Club. There are large areas around these with no water and uh, no planting. This is the coast live oak in San Jose. Um, in other words, uh, many of our native trees will work if you choose the right tree for the right place. This is going to be a very large tree. These are coast live oaks in San Jose. And these are uh, probably, <coughs> well, one of the deficits of, of deficits of being my age is that you remember when th things like this were planted. Um, these are about 35, 40 years old. And um, uh, one of the characteristics of native uh, oaks is that, well, I publish a little booklet that's six pages long of uh, pests and diseases of our native oaks, but specifically coast live oak, or primarily coast live oak. Um, this is uh, a, a fungal disease that uh, attacks and kills, it's called tw a twig blight that attacks coast live oaks. Um, one of the things many people do, you hopefully you aren't amongst them, um, if they see a problem like this, they immediately call a pest control company and say, do something, uh, kill it. Um, the, of this six pages of insects and diseases that I publish, there are probably only two or three on the whole six pages of things that are worth treating. So this is a naturally occurring phenomenon in Coast Live Oak. And it's usually seen only in the lower canopy where the uh, light level is low and usually the air movement is poor. That's a nice place for fungi to live. And this one will be one of them. Um, one of the things one has to do if you're going to grow California native trees in your garden is know what those diseases are, know which ones are significant and important, and know which ones are worth treating. In this case, a lot of pest control companies make good money off of treating things like this that really don't need to be treated because they don't kill trees. So if you're going to have natives, you've got to learn what these things are and understand what's worth treating, what isn't, and tolerate some dead twigs in your tree. Just you have to learn that it doesn't matter. Yes? Where can we get a copy of your six-page booklet? I'd be happy to supply it to you if, uh, okay, if my memory's only that long. Send me a note that you I need. Leave it. That. <laughs> yes. um, I, but um, that's just one of the things that one has to get used to uh, thinking about differently. Um, see this results of chewing here. If any of you are from Palo Alto and you drive through the Stanford Medical Center uh, property uh, in the last month, you'll notice a lot of the uh, evergreen oaks, close live oak, don't have any leaves. Um, this is the first year for about 13 years 
that uh, California oak moth has been present. These are a small gray moth. The adult is a moth, and they have a very characteristic flight pattern. If you have them, you'll know it because, uh, it, well, in in the med center area, you can't walk without batting them aside. There are thousands of them around, and uh, they lay eggs. Well, uh, the eggs they laid in fall hatch in spring into caterpillars that are very hungry. And this year there have been so many you can stand under the trees and hear them crunching. Um, and in the worst cases they've stripped trees. They, in a, a bad year like this they're going to have a second generation. That second generation is going to come from eggs the, the moths are laying right now. Those, those eggs will hatch uh, early next month and into caterpillars that will be chewing another set of leaves in July and August. Um, fortunately in Northern California the second generation of them is usually, usually not too destructive. But now there are plenty of pest control companies out there making a fortune spraying these. In the first place um, if you spray them now, after they've chewed all of the tree, they'll all be on the ground and you can say, wow, that really worked. Except they'd already chewed all the leaves off the tree. So who are you doing it for? <laughs> if you're doing it for the tree, don't bother now. It's way too late. And um, the, if you're going to try to prevent this, you need to be aware there are going to be plenty of eggs left over for next spring. So you need to spray just as the new foliage emerges to prevent the next spring's infestation. But better still is recognizing if you watch the populations of uh, California oak moth over the years, you realize it doesn't hurt the trees. They'll lose all their leaves and in a month they produce a whole new set of leaves and they're all green again. So. This is one more of those things you have to understand. If, if you have a coast live oak in a year of bad uh, California oak uh, moth infestation, one and probably the best option is just live with it <laughs> because the trees won't care. <laughs> so do the moths um, provide uh, themselves food for bats and birds? I'm sorry to sorry. move. Out. Pardon me? Are the, are the moths, the gray moths, are they food themselves for bats and birds and other things? Um, or how does that work? I've outside? never, that's a good question. Are they a uh, food for bats or birds or whatever? Uh, I've never seen birds eating them. And, uh, uh, I've, uh, I must say they're very woolly. I can imagine they don't taste very good. but. Not being a bird, I don't know. Uh, but um, uh, there are, you know, if if uh, the birds were eating them, we'd have a lot of fat birds around because there are millions of these things this year. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that if you're in Campbell or even Menlo Park, you're going to have them. And even if you're in Palo Alto, uh, you'll often find that this tree is stripped by the, these insects, and the next tree is not even bothered. Uh, apparently one tree has more sugar than the other, I, I don't know. But in any case, I, I don't mean to dwell on this, but it's one more example of having to understand the uh, life cycle of the of the natives if you're going to have natives in your garden. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry, my, both my hearing and my eyesight are bad. What, yes, ma'am. What do the caterpillars look like? I see the, the moths all over the place, but I've never seen the caterpillars. What, are you asking what the caterpillars look like? Yeah. Yes. Uh, they're about an inch long, and um, they uh, are black and orange, black with orange stripes, and um, they don't really look like any other caterpillar you're going to see. If And if you've seen the gray moths flitting around in October, you better expect to have moths and caterpillars next spring. Because it's October when you're going to see the moths laying eggs for 
next spring. Uh, in this case, we've got moths now that are laying for the second generation. Um, the irony is, in Monterey County, uh, oak moth has been really bad for several years, but we haven't had it here until this year. Um, um, another example, that's a coast live oak. This is sprinklers on the trunk, and in a moment you'll see why this is bad news. Um, oh boy, there's, the slides have gotten a little mixed here, but we, uh, we can work with it. Um, this is what happens if you uh, water a, a native oak, especially a coast live oak, this is a cemetery in, Los, in Saratoga, and um, uh, as soon as you water oaks during the summer, either oak root fungus, Armillaria melia, or Phytophthora, water mold disease, kill the roots, and then it falls over. Notice it's still got foliage. In other words, um, the trunk and branches have enough stored liquid that they can feed some foliage for a while, but at some point there's no more supply from down here and the whole process gives up. Um, what this, this is obviously not a native, this is a DNR cedar. It was, let's see, is it possible to move this side and not the other one? Which side? This, the left? Right. Right. Move the left and keep the left. Ah, thank you. Now we're back in synchronization. Um, I didn't have a, a good slide to use for this other than the cedar. Uh, these trees have both been severely over thin. Uh, they've been... Uh, <clears throat> many people that prune trees think the way to prune a tree is crawl up the tree and cut off whatever you can reach. And when you can't reach anymore, you stop pruning. Well, um, I bet there are quite a few of you in here that are engineers. If you think about it from an engineering principle, it's obvious this doesn't work. Uh, if you strip off the food supply on these branches, the branch doesn't grow in diameter any longer, any, uh, anymore. But the only place new growth can occur is out here. So you get more growth out here, longer length, and more weight displaced farther away from uh, the fulcrum. And guess what? You have, have broken branches. Uh, this isn't exclusively a natural phenomenon. This is caused by somebody you paid to create the problem. Uh, this, this branch is a prime candidate for breaking because it has so much weight here, very little taper, and great length. It's a mechanical question. It's not horticultural. Um, cedars have very poor taper most conifers, pines, are the same way. The, the limbs are not well tapered. Notice here, a very long limb with very poor taper. If you strip out the middle, new growth is only out here, and eventually, as the tree get, develops longer limbs, mm -hmm. you end up with a limb breakage. Uh, just coincidentally, in a Dara cedar, when that limb breaks, it's, they're so fragile, it's going to break off the limbs below it, and like that, you have a tree with one side missing. So this is caused by some fool with a chainsaw that never had any plant physiology training. And uh, so if, you're ha if you have ca uh, California native oaks in your garden, for gosh sakes, learn about the principles of pruning. Uh, the International Society of Arboriculture has plenty of literature about it. Just don't let somebody strip out the middle like that. That's very destructive. Uh, the problem is that by the time the limb breaks, you don't remember five years ago, some, somebody was up there pruning my tree. You, most people don't put those two things together. But then whoever did that is very responsible for broken limbs. And I apologize for spending so much time on, what would you say, uh, things other than plant identification here. Um, uh, what trees, what native trees can you use in your garden? Uh, 
depends on the size of your lot, but I doubt that's going to fit in most people's garden. That's a Quercus chrysolipus, a canyon live oak, which has the upper side of the foliage is dark green, the underside is either a, a glabrous or a glaucous gray or even rusty color. Um, this is uh, my wife at the base of that same canyon live oak, Quercus chrysolipus. Uh, that's not going to fit in most people's gardens. Um, however, here's a young Quercus chrysolipus uh, canyon live oak. Um, that's in a school uh, courtyard in Saratoga. A delightful tree, well-formed, beautiful uh, structure, beautiful foliage. In other words, if you can, uh, if living with this young, well-formed teenager for a while is good enough for you, none of us are going to live long enough to see for that to be this anyhow. So there's nothing wrong with planting a Quercus chrysolipus in your garden. Just realize that someday it's going to be a lot of tree. Uh, these are the acorns from Quercus chrysolipus. Aren't they magnificent? Uh, it's called gold cup oak for obvious reasons. Um, those are Quercus chrysolipus uh, in the Santa Cruz Mountains uh, facing the ocean. Um, those are um, this plant almost always appears on a slope usually facing north or east, and if you're going to plant one in your garden, realize uh, this isn't getting any water. The soil is clay, but it's never too wet, and um, uh, if you don't mind a tree that has a form like that, it's a wonderful tree. Um, most people have seen blue oaks, Quercus Douglasi, but haven't lived with them. Um, now, if you live in Los Altos Hills or Los Altos, you probably are very familiar with blue oak. The best blue oak usually looks like it's half dead. Um, <laughs> if you have blue oaks, either you're wondering what's wrong with them or you're used to living with them, because blue oaks always choose these hilltops. Uh, they choose places where the soil is only about a foot thick. Little rain sticks there. It's a miserable place to live. And that's where blue oaks uh, will uh, occur. And you can recognize the foliage by the lobe, the, the uh, uh, tips being rounded. There aren't any real spines on these. And of course, they're deciduous. And so if you have blue oaks, in the first place, don't expect them to be beautiful, lush, uh, full trees, because they aren't. Uh, they, uh, they will usually have a fairly open, uh, a very open and kind of a not really great looking tree, but that's, that's typical blue oak. <clears throat> this is Valley Oak, Quercus lobata. This is probably way too large for most people's gardens. Um, it's a magnificent tree. This is the uh, leaf. Notice the deep lobes, the, the reason for lobata. Um, and uh, no spines on the tips. Um, that's mistletoe, a common problem in, uh, in, blue, in um, valley oaks. But notice where they are. See, here's a creek bed. And um, notice it's in the valley. It's not up on the hills. Certainly some appear all over the hills around us here, but this is their preferred environment. The finest valley oaks in the United States are in Sacramento Valley, where the acorns float in the Sacramento River when it's full. When the water goes down, the acorns are left at the top. They germinate. So they've got water near them during the winter, but during the summer, they've got roots down into um, the permanent water source. And I should, that's a reason to bring up something that seems contradictory to what I've told you. That is what are called sinker roots. 
um, after this tree has produced all these um, these uh, buttress roots that are out there building a platform to hold it up, if there's water down below at 20 feet, uh, in Palo Alto you have many trees with sinker roots, about three or four feet from the trunk, uh, if there's water down there, they'll put down a root that goes right straight down to the water. So valley oaks will often take care of themselves. They do need some water, but don't get it on their own because they choose to be where there's water underground. So if you see valley oaks, you know there's water down there. Uh, might be a long ways down for that. So, yes, ma'am. Uh, the picture on the left, was yes, it possibly taken about 30 years so years ago in Almaden Quicksilver Park? <laughs> You're amazing. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I know that you view. Know, this is hard to believe. <laughs> She's precisely right. <laughs> I took that picture about 30 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of those trees is gone now. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? <laughs> I hiked there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's, that's, like a, that's, a, that's a CNPS fellow for you. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, everyone, that's Sally Casey. She's a founding member of the Santa Clara Valley chapter of CNPS. <laughs> um, notice all that mistletoe up there. That is uh, it's a parasitic um, plant that is, uh, there are, um, well, see there is some uh, scotch moss hanging from this, but that is not parasitic. That's merely finding a nice place to live. But um, it, it, the scotch moss and the tillandsias that live in trees are just living on the moisture that travels through the air and any dust. Um, this is a different matter. The seeds of mistletoe, especially broadleaf mistletoe, are carried by birds. Uh, the seeds are sticky. The birds get them stuck to their um, to their feet, then they fly to another tree, and the seed comes off and germinates there and bores into the, tr uh, the tr uh, wood of the vascular system of the tree. It is literally feeding off of the tree. Uh, if you have mistletoe, you really should ta pay, pay attention to it. It's very destructive. And um, um, the best way to do that is to um, well, I would suggest you not do it yourself. Have an arbor go up there and um, break off all the stems and foliage. And that will leave what's called a hostoria. It looks like a, a half an avocado, this dark green. And um, you can spray or paint that hostoria with Roundup herbicide. And uh, you mix one part Roundup, three parts water, and just paint that, and then you wrap that whole thing with black plastic. And if you uh, prohibit a light from getting to that hostoria, it can't produce new, uh, new foliage and you can kill it. Sometimes it takes two to three years, and sometimes you have to do it all over again, but it really works. Um, sorry for the sideline. Uh, black oak one of the most elegant of our native trees. It's a big tree. As I said before, if you're going to plant black oak, be prepared for it to be a big tree. And once it reaches, again, about four or five inches and about 15 feet tall, be prepared for it to put out two feet of growth in all directions every year uh, if they're happy. Um, it's the only uh, oak a uh, native oak I can think of that has really wonderful fall color. Uh, well, but this is spring color. Isn't that beautiful foliage? That's juvenile foliage emerging in spring. So if you're going to plant one, plant it where it's near a second floor deck so you can stand there and look right at this new foliage. It's really wonderful. Very good question. So what are the conditions, what are the conditions under which the black oak will thrive? Uh, and what about it? What are the conditions? Oh, thank you. And I'm sorry, my hearing's awful. It'll get it worse. Um, 
uh, black oak occurs naturally almost exclusively on at high elevations, oh, well, high, I mean, not on the ground floor, usually at uh, oh, 1,500 to about three, 4,000 feet, uh, almost exclusively on a slope. You very seldom see these naturally on a, an area of flat land and almost uh, exclusively facing, um, well, north or east. They'll often be facing west, but where they're in a, in an understory so they're protected. This is a tree that would be an understory tree when it's young. In other words, it would be protected by a, a canopy of either old black oaks or other trees. But um, as it begins maturing, it becomes the boss. It's <laughs> the biggest thing around. Oh, and um, one of the characteristics of the place this grows is gravelly soil or no soil at all, nothing but gravel. Um, they have to have good drainage. Uh, they are susceptible to sudden oak death um, and where they uh, occur naturally, sudden oak death is a problem, but that's not here. Somebody asked me about sudden oak death in Livermore. The problem is the, well, I can call it information um, about sudden oak death seems to me it's basically scaring people that without logic. Uh, sudden oak death is going to be primarily in the uh, Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, Skyline Boulevard is a prime area and in Marin County. Um, if you are down here with a single tree in your yard, it's impossible to have sudden oak death. That's, it's just not a problem. And but if you're up in the mountains, black oak is one of the species that's susceptible to sudden oak death. Um, but uh, uh, this is fall color, exceptionally good fall color, but fall color on black oak. This is a black oak that is thought to be over 500 years old. Now, the trouble is often people see an old tree and assume it's ancient and it's probably not quite that old but just not a magnificent old structure. Uh, but, hey, um, this is probably the finest evergreen oak native to California. This is island oak, Quercus tomentella. Um, this is taken on Santa Cruz Island and that tree is probably 50 feet or 60 feet tall with a trunk about two and a half feet in diameter. Uh, here's the juvenile foliage, uh, although there is there's foliage up here of Quercus tomentella if you want to take a look at it. Um, it's, uh, these branches are taken from my garden. It's um, very, very difficult or impossible to buy one unless you buy it through the Nature Conservancy. But um, uh, it's a marvelous tree. And uh, mine are obviously producing seed, or I wouldn't have these seedlings coming up. So if uh, somebody wishes to uh, come to our place in October, probably, there might be seed there, I don't know. But um, if you're looking for the very best, the most elegant of the uh, California native uh, evergreen oaks, this is pretty hard to beat this. Um, you can. See, the underside of the foliage is glaucous, in other words, gray, and the juvenile foliage is very spiny. Mature foliage varies between spiny and entire, in other words, with no spines. What that's telling you, this is a very close relative of a canyon live oak, which has all those same character. So uh, they're obviously related. I'm sorry, I keep moving around. Um, uh, this is a wonderful tree that most people don't know anything about. Its name's been changed, but the taxonomists have been changing names a lot in the last few years. Um, this uh, is taken in the Los Gatos Mountains, and it used to be called Quercus uh, dumosa, 
It's now called um, Quercus berberitifolia, or barberry oak. Uh, that stand is probably over 100 years old, and it's only about 12 feet tall. Um, when the, the, if you ever see one with a trunk more than oh, six inches in diameter, I'd like to know about it because they're, they, they are very, very slow growing. Um, this is probably the oldest stand I've ever seen. It's in Los Altos. And um, uh, they usually grow as a, a, a group like this in a stand, uh, but they're not a multi-stem tree. Those are all individual trunks. And uh, it has tiny leaves. Um, Sudworth, in his dendrology and discussion about oaks, said, this is one of those trees you can't identify by the foliage or the seed pods or the acorn cups, or, or the acorns or the acorn cups, because they vary so much that you could have a Quercus uh, dorata, which is a closely related one, with all the same characters. <laughs> the only way you can tell the difference is that dorata would only appear uh, in serpentine, and this one doesn't, and dorata has a, a gall, a, a, a wasp gall. The wasps don't attack this species. So the insects know the difference, but um, in any case, if, if uh, these are easily transplanted, if you ever wanted to purchase one of these clumps from somebody that doesn't want it, a, um, a good tree mover could move that easily. Uh, but in any case, it's a tree that most people don't know. It's a wonderful uh, tree. I wish I had somebody standing by this. Uh, that's probably 15 feet tall or maybe 18. This is only about 12, uh, but ancient. So do they go from acorn? Yes, yes. It's an oak. It grows, but uh, don't hold your breath. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What soil? Ah, the right question. That's that's the most important question. Very dry, um, a lot of um, rock in it, very good drainage, and uh, this area gets about 20 inches of rainfall a year. And um, so. Uh, that's probably the reason they're growing so slowly. I've grown them as a nursery crop uh, only because I'm crazy, but just, uh, they, they grow about half an inch a year. And if you, uh, after five years, you've got this little bitty thing. But um, in any case, if, uh, a good bone size of it. Um, this is um, a plant most people will never see. Uh, because um, there are very few of them. This is a oak hybrid, and um, the oak taxonomist, uh, Dr. Taylor at the university, no, at Stanford, I guess, when he was alive, said we shouldn't be naming oaks because they're evolving so rapidly. Uh, it's a, a, a human ego thing to put a name on it. The plant uh, is, they're changing so fast that we really couldn't be naming, shouldn't be naming them yet. This is uh, Quercus morihus, M-O-R-E-H-U-S, and it's a hybrid between an evergreen and a deciduous mm -hmm. oak, which mm -hmm. you th if you think about it, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> this is a hybrid between coast live oak, Quercus agrifolia, and Quercus ke uh, kellogi, the black oak. Mm -hmm. and this one is uh, in an old uh, property of, uh, above Los Gatos, and um, uh, it uh, is deciduous, except that it doesn't lose leaves until about January. Everything else that's going to lose leaves is long deciduous. This still has leaves on it. Um, so this is a Quercus marahus, and, and um, uh, it bears viable seed. Uh, but it's not something you'll ever be able to buy. I, um, now, non-oak species that you might want to consider uh, for your garden, many of these are far better uh, candidates 
Uh, this is our native uh, dogwood, Quercus, I'm sorry, Quercus of the mine, uh, Cornus natalii. And um, this is taken up in the Sierras, uh, growing as an understory under big dug firs. And that's the kind of thing I'm telling you, you need to think about. Notice this isn't growing out in the open sun, it isn't growing down on a flat area, it's growing with a canopy giving it shade during a good part of the year. So if you're going to plant a most dogwoods, but especially our native dogwood, you need to think about that. There is a what's called a disjunct stand of this dogwood in um, Boulder Creek. And, no, I'm sorry. Boulder Creek, no, no. Uh, Felton. And um, so you can see, oh, probably a hundred or two of them up there. But uh, they germinate from seed easily if you know how to treat them. Um, but they're available in the trade. And this is a fine tree that's worth planting in a garden. It's upright, uh, not very broad, and reasonably fast growing. Uh, I've seen them grow two feet a year, and it's a plant that is worth your using. But it um, needs rhododendron-like conditions. It occurs naturally in an area uh, with deep alluvial, uh, 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 I'm sorry, deep um, uh, uh, mulch on the surface, a foot or more deep, and it occurs in areas with uh, very well-drained but moist soil, redwood kind of a country. So don't put it beside your drought-tolerant oaks, <coughs> not where it belongs. This is a wonderful tree that is uh, seeing more use all the time, uh, that should be used, deserves to be used more. Uh, you wouldn't know it to look at it, but it's in the rose family. And this is Lionothamnus floribundus esplenifolia, the cut leaf or lace leaf ironwood. Uh, this is the bark, and uh, many times as these mature, they develop uh, a twisted trunk that will turn uh, one entire revolution in three feet. Um, and very, well, some people say messy bark because this peels off in sections. So, the and this, I'm sorry. What are the growing conditions for this? Um, any place there's a little water. And, <coughs> oh, the question was growing conditions. That's in Carmel as a street tree. Uh, they've given it um, a uh, three by three foot square. The trunk is about three by three. And um, so it's surviving primarily on whatever moisture is in the air. Um, but uh, I've, and I've seen wonderful specimens in um, uh, Half Moon Bay, in Morro Bay, and it it's, prefers to be near the ocean because it's from the Catalina Islands. Coyote but, Point also. I'm sorry? Coyote Point. Yes, yes. Great. Yes. Right. And, um, but it's, it's a great tree that deserves more use. I planted uh, one in Campbell 40 years ago. It's now about 50 feet tall and beautiful specimen. It just needs decent soil. Uh, that's another one, uh, but uh, I don't remember where that is. Here are the flowers, um, huge umbels, uh, about a foot in diameter, and they're very nice, cut fresh, or let them dry, and they're still very ornamental. But um, it's a wonderful tree that deserves more use. Uh, one of the trees that most people know if they drive through the mountains here is uh, Acer macrophyllum, meaning large leaf. And it is, you know, the leaf's that, that big. Um, this occurs naturally from here clear up to Seattle and beyond, uh, well, into British Columbia. And um, uh, this is fall color. This is the juvenile foliage as it emerges, bright red, and beautiful flower clusters. Um, it's a, a, a very nice tree. There are two stumps from 
um, big leaf maple on Summit Road that are four feet across. Uh, there are remnants of trees that are no longer there, but the stumps are enormous. Um, a tree that is underused, that really deserves use, is uh, California Buckeye, Aesculus californica. Uh, when they're in bloom, the, you can't miss them if you're driving them. On Highway 280, uh, near um, Arastadero, um, there's a north-facing hillside that most of the year looks like green trees. Uh, in spring, all of a sudden you realize three quarters of the, of the hillside is buckeyes. And now, I'm sure you all know that it's summer deciduous. Um, it's drought tolerant to some degree, it's, it's, but that's not very accurate. More accurate would be to call it drought avoiding. It avoids drought by getting rid of the leaf surface w w that would use for water. Uh, so it's not truly drought tolerant. This is a plant that really uh, would grow where there's water underground, but it uh, doesn't use water in the summer because it doesn't have any leaves. Some people can't tolerate that. It's another of these things. If you're going to use California natives, you've got to think differently than you're used to thinking about garden plants. Um, this is it in the summer, and the stems are silver. They have a lot of character in the twisted, angular branching. An old one is, in my opinion, a lovely tree. A good plant to plant azaleas under. It'll tolerate the water. It gives you part shade for the azaleas. Um, in any case, a great tree. It does have one idiosyncrasy most of you probably already have heard. The pollen is poisonous to bees. Mm -hmm. And of course, when they're bloom, the bees are all over them. And how this works, I can't understand. But apparently, when they carry that pollen back to the hive, it kills, kills the hive. Um, don't ask, I don't understand it. Doesn't make any sense, but the fact remains there. Um, uh, this is um, our native madrone, Arbutus menziesii. I suggest you not waste your time trying to grow this in your garden. Uh, if you're dedicated, you've got excellent drainage, very gravelly soil, and you're willing to not water near this tree, you might make it work. Um, but see this branch is declining. It has a disease called Botryosphyria, which um, kills, makes cankers on the trunk. And you'll see old madrones with massive areas that are dead at the base. That's from Botryosphyria. And when they finally fall over, it was Botryosphyria that killed them. And the symptom is most commonly seen in spring when the flower stem emerges, the top of this uh, woody portion at the base of the flower stem becomes infected, and then it travels from there down the branch and down into the tree and kills branches. If you drive through the mountains and look carefully, you'll see almost every madrone tree in the Santa Cruz Mountains is infected. Um, and over a 50-year period, it kills them. Uh, this tree, this picture was taken in 1950. That tree is long gone. But uh, uh, you need to recognize that there are other Arbutus, um, Arbutus unedo from, um, oh, from Yugoslavia, clear into uh, the uh, Indo. Well, grows in most of uh, Western Europe, uh, and I'm sorry, and um, Arbutus marina, the new hybrid madrone, um, are wonderful trees. They work very well here. They don't have any background similar to our madrone, and they are nearly as garden sensitive. So, uh, and there's, I don't know where it all started, but. Some people think that Arbutus marina 
is a hybrid with our native madrone that's one of the parents, and that's nonsense. Uh, it's a hybrid between Arbutus canariensis from the Canary Islands and Arbutus andracnoides from Greece, and there's no madrone in the heritage. Um, this is uh, incense cedar. Again, someday it's going to be a big tree, but when it's young and cute, well, you might want to consider it for your garden, but um, again, it does not like water, um, uh, or it doesn't like frequent water. Um, at the Madronia Cemetery in Saratoga that I uh, work with, um, they had probably eight of these in an area that wasn't yet developed for, for uh, graves and not water. As soon as they developed that and started watering it, um, with lawn, uh, for a lawn, the, with, these started dying. And uh, we've lost probably six big ones like that. Uh, so if you can, uh, can adapt to its needs, you can make it work. But you've got to recognize what it wants. If you are driving up to the Sierras, you'll see these all along the roadsides. But get out and look at the uh, what they're growing in, you'll find there's no dirt in town. It's all rock, gravel, and uh, uh, the only water they get is snowfall in the winter. Uh, so it's a great tree, but it needs specific treatment. But that's intentional. Uh, small uh, uh, shrub or shrubs that will you can make into trees. Uh, there are several, but the problem is most people think that means you can strip this up. This is California redbud, Circus occidentalis. That's it out in the wild. Um, most, it, or a lot of people think you can strip this up, take off all the low branches, and it'll survive. In the first place, California redbud is very sensitive to water mold disease by Tophthra cinnamomai. Uh, where you see it in the wild up in the, uh, uh, oh, in the, the geysers area. Um, we were doing a research project up there and they were all over the place. But if you look carefully, you'll notice they're always on a slope. They're never on the flat areas. They're usually on a slope that's facing north. So they're not in the hottest microsite. Uh, they're always multi-stem. The big old ones are all like 15 stems, just a big push. So there's nothing wrong with using California red bud if you've got really well-drained soil and you don't demand that it be a single-stem lollipop. If you can allow it to be what it is, it's a good plan. But water it once too many times and next week you find it's dead. So. It's a plant that, if you see a good red bud in most gardens, it's not this, it's usually Canadian red bud. Um, so, California red bud's a great plant, but just be aware of what it needs. Uh, this is a plant that most people will never see. Uh, oh, God, it's not on your list, but I hope I can remember its name. Um, it's in the same plant family as manzanitas, the heath family, and um, if you wanted to make a multi-stem small tree out of this, you could. It's, uh, a hazelnut? I'm pardon? Is this a hazelnut? California hazelnut? No, no, it's uh, hazelnuts not in the Aracaceae family. <laughs> this is, um, I'm sorry, I did this I, I don't remember. It's a, uh, let's go on to the next one. Um, this is one of the um, native creek dogwoods. Now, to me, you'd have to be a masochist to try to make a tree out of this, <laughs> but if you don't mind a body body stem tree, shrub, uh, this is probably the best of them. This one is called uh, Cornus Cerisio winter fire, and um, 
it's uh, just that spectacular. <laughs> this is looking get? through it in the winter. How tall is it and big? Um, this is at my place in a seat where water is there most of the time, Creek Dogwood, and these are about 12 or 15 feet by, it's, it's one that likes to travel. It'll send out stolons and come up over there and in your neighbors and the neighbors <laughs> neighbors. And, um, but it's a spectacular plant. This is uh, juvenile foliage when it was young. But um, you can see it isn't a shrub, it isn't a tree or a shrub, it's a bramble. But if you had enough patience and didn't mind thinning it, it's, uh, you could use it that way. I use it just as a massive background mass of color. Uh, <clears throat> this is another shrub that's a native shrub that uh, if you had enough patience and didn't mind doing a lot of careful pruning, uh, you could make it into a small tree. Um, Calacanthus occidentalis, western spice bush. And it's a wonderful plant that should be used more if, um, here's the flower, they look like crepe paper, um, and the seed pod is a little uh, ovate thing. Um, I remember an, a uh, horticulturist friend said that you can recognize them because every seed pod has three um, uh, uh, earwigs in it. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, this needs, uh, I have a huge one of these. Um, in our lower garden, it uh, was planted from four one gallons about 10 years ago. It's now a mass about 50 feet long, 10 feet high, and we prune it by going through it every about every four or five years and cutting it to stumps that fall and just let it regrow. But you could choose a few good branches and make a small tree out of it, and depending on how much you like to prove. See an author. This is a big if. Uh, you'll see in Sunset Garden Book, it'll tell you about making a tree out of a sea an office. Um, I hate to say it, but because the garden editor is an old, old friend, but they're crazy. Um, <laughs> Um, this is Ceanothus uh, thersiflorus snow flurry. It's one of the biggest ones. It's one that does grow naturally. Thersiflorus occurs naturally in the mountains around us here. So it's not illogical to grow this, but usually when you start trimming up a Ceanothus and removing low branches, it's the beginning of the end. They usually after that in a few years start dying. Um, now there is an exception. If you're in a coastal climate with really well-drained soil and a coastal environment, there is a Ceanothus, Ceanothus arboreus that occurs on the islands and there is a cultivar called um, Carl Schmidt, I think it is, Carl Schmidt, as grown by um, Native Sons Nursery at Arroyo Grande, and from a hundred feet away, you'd swear it was a coast live oak. Has a trunk a foot in diameter, 25 feet tall with a 20 foot spread. But when you get a little closer, here are these giant glossy green leaves. They're, so it's a, a true anomaly, but this plant is not going to grow in Campbell. It has to be right on the coast. And um, it's only available, as far as I know, for this one nursery. Yes, sir. Um, do you not recommend Ray Hartman? Ray Hartman is a hybrid between Arbutus, uh, I'm sorry, Ceanothus okay. arboreus and Ceanothus griseus. And that's the one that Sunset talks about making into a tree. Um, I can guarantee you, for every one that you've seen that's working, I can show you five more that are dying. Uh, it's, I would not try to make a tree out of that. In other words, by, by that I'm def 
the definition of that in my mind is pruning off the low branches so you have all your canopy above you. Uh, that doesn't work. If you don't mind a really big shrub, it's fine for that, but it is really inconsistent. Uh, you'll find it works like magic here, and then two blocks away, they can't keep it alive. And water mold is usually what kills it, but I can't explain why. Cedar uh, and Trey Hartman is one I never recommend landscape architects use because so many times they fail and then they get blamed for the failure. <laughs> and um, if you uh, need to um, to uh, support your trees, <laughs> this is a new way to do it. If you live near the hospital, they have it used uh, crutches you can use. Um, so that's all I have. I hope that's been useful to you.